Yeah, so our next presentation um, is there on the screen, Community Building Through International Collaboration on Multilingual Linked Open Data vo Vocabulary, Nomenclature for Museum Cataloging, um, presented by Heather Dunn and Chang Dang. Um, and um, Chang is a, an IT technical advisor with the Canadian Heritage Information Network with a focus on data management and development. Heather is a heritage information analyst with the Canadian Heritage Information Network with a focus on museum collections management and documentation. Um, whenever you're ready. Good, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for attending our session. Um, so as Hollis said, I'm Heather Dunn, a heritage information analyst with the Canadian Heritage Information Network. And I'm part of the team responsible for nomenclature for museum cataloging. So um, today, Trang and I will be sharing our experience with nomenclature, um, how it's developed and supported through community involvement and partnerships, and how we use linked open data to provide access to this multilingual vocabulary. Um, so I'll begin by giving a brief introduction to nomenclature, including sort of an overview of the linked open data features, and I'll also describe the governance of nomenclature and how it's developed in collaboration with the community that it serves. And then Trang will talk about um, sort of the technical side, the technical challenges and solutions that Chin has seen while trying to support multiple languages and scripts, um, designing for accessibility, integrating nomenclature with museum collections management software, and of course, leveraging the power of linked open data. So I will start with uh, just a brief introduction for those of you who are not familiar with nomenclature. So um, nomenclature for museum cataloging is a vocabulary and classification system for object names. And it's used by historic sites and museums, um, local history societies that are cataloging historical and ethnological collections. It contains approximately 15,000 concepts and they're arranged in a simple hierarchy that's grouped primarily by the functional context. Um, it's, right now it's fully bilingual English and French and it also includes um, Spanish terms and inuktitut. And we've also included Canadian English and Canadian French variants wherever it's warranted. And nomenclature is used across Canada and the US and also internationally to some extent. And it's been incorporated within most collections management systems that are used by museums. Um, it was first published in 1978 and it's been continuously developed and maintained through a partnership between the American Association for State and Local History or AASLH, um, Canadian Heritage Information Network or CHIN and Parks Canada. Um, so just a few words about how nomenclature has evolved in the past few years. So although it was originally available only in English, it's been fully bilingual English and French since the first online version was published in 2018. Um, in 2020, it was published as linked open data under a Creative Commons attribution license. So whereas um, before 2020, users could only search and browse nomenclature on the, on the online version on the website, um, in 2020, users could begin to download Excel files or RDF files in various serializations. Um, in 2022, we developed a more enhanced semantic model. And in 2023, we launched a Sparkle endpoint and saw their linked data features to enable easier integration with museum collections management systems. And as of 2024, we have an API available. Um, so I'm probably preaching to the choir here because I'm sure most of you are <laughs> familiar with the, the benefits of standardized <laughs> um, cataloging, but um, just to give a little context, um, some of the benefits of using controlled vocabularies like nomenclature um, include the uh, facilitation of search um, and the make, to make it easier to use and share museum collections data. So this is obviously important for all museum functions. Um, nomenclature provides concise and consistent names for objects, 
which obviously allows easier data entry and also more efficient retrieval. Um, so we also, nomenclature also provides a classification structure that, that, as I said, kind of groups objects together primarily by their function, which allows museums to easily work with record groups. And that hierarchical arrangement of object terms um, is designed to help catalogers quickly and accurately find the best term. So it's either a very specific term that they may need or a more general concept. Um, to meet whatever needs they have and their level of knowledge of the object they're cataloging. And in addition to facilitating that work of catalogers, that hierarchical arrangement also helps with the data retrieval, so object searches can be narrowed or broadened very easily. Um, and in addition to those obvious benefits for data entry and retrieval, um, nomenclature can also be used for museum data cleanup and enhancement, which Trang will be talking about a little later. So I wanted to talk a bit about um, governance and community involvement. So nomenclature is continually developed and maintained by two committees made up of volunteer members. Uh, first of all, the Nomenclature Committee, which is coordinated by the American Association for State and Local History. And, and that committee has members from across Canada and the USA, and it's responsible for approving new concepts and terms submitted by museums in English. Uh, secondly, we have a Canadian Nomenclature Committee coordinated by the Canadian Heritage Information Network. And that committee ensures that French terminology is included for each concept, um, that Canadian regional terms are added, and that the needs of Canadian museums are met. So, and we also have um, support from professional terminologists within the Government of Canada's Translation Bureau, which is very helpful. There are also multiple subcommittees operating, and those subcommittees are assigned specific areas to focus on for terminology development. Usually those subcommittees are formed when the nomenclature committee identifies an area of the hierarchy that needs some focused attention. Uh, for example, there's currently a subcommittee for military and paramilitary objects. Um, there's a subcommittee for toys. There's one for um, adding new images into nomenclature, um, one for Wikidata matching, and so on. So that's, um, it's, those are all also volunteer members. And subject experts in a particular type of object, for example, shoes or watercraft, will sometimes be invited to contribute to the development of terminology in their field. And a very important point here is that terminology is continuously submitted by museums and individuals from across North America and beyond. Um, there are online forms on the nomenclature website that the public, with usually um, workers, museum workers, can submit terms or request changes. Um, and museums also sometimes submit batches of terms, especially the larger museums after having done a reconciliation of their data with the nomenclature um, terminology, then they submit the terms that they need to describe their collections, but that were not found in nomenclature. So sometimes we get huge batches from, from museums that have done that work. Um, and in summary, since it was first published in 1978 and throughout all the various iterations since then, um, nomenclature has really been improved and expanded by inviting input from the museum community that it serves. Um, I'll now explain a bit about nomenclature as a multilingual resource. So as I mentioned earlier, it contains several languages and la language variants. It's been a fully bilingual English French resource since 2018. Um, in addition to that, Chin and Parks Canada have been involved in um, nomenclature's development to make sure that the terminology um, needs that Canadian museums specifically have are met within this resource. But in 2018, for the first time, we began to include um, Canadian regional English and Canadian regional French terminology within nomenclature. So looking more closely at a concept page, in this case for body armor, you can see here that I've selected the Canadian linguistic variants. So the display shows the armor spelled with a U, which is the Canadian spelling. Um, Co-referencing is one of the ways that we are leveraging the power of linked open data, for example, to include other languages in nomenclature. 
Um, in 2019, the Getty Vocabulary Program um, very kindly undertook a project to co-reference or match nomenclature and the art and architecture thesaurus. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have some Wikidata volunteers that are continually working on matching nomenclature. We had a pretty good momentum a few years ago with that group of volunteers, but they've kind of petered out. <laughs> so we're going to have to, um, I think, once our development work is done, we'll focus more on um, getting that um, some of these um, co-referencing projects um, started again. Anyway, so um, wherever we have a match between AAT or Wikidata concepts, um, links are being established both ways between, so from nomenclature to and from. And any changes or additions to these matches are um, made in the AAT by the um, Getty editors and in Wikidata by the volunteers. And nomenclature runs a script um, to refresh and update those references in nomenclature. So here you can see the other references tab we have for this concept. Um, this shows how the um, the concept shows up in other linked open data vocabularies. So for this particular concept, there are only links with Wikidata and the AAT, but other concepts have links to other vocabulary sources like Library of Congress subject headings and others. And matches will kind of be increased and improved over time. Um, and as a result of the co-referencing between AAT and nomenclature, all of the 15,000 plus French terms from nomenclature were made available within the AAT and wherever there's a match between AAT and nomenclature concepts and a Spanish term exists within AAT, um, nomenclature users will see the Spanish term with the AAT cited as its source um, seen, as seen in that circled area in my slide. Um, so, and um, nomenclature is striving to be ever more diverse and multilingual, accessible, inclusive. Um, in addition to being uh, bilingual English French, as an agency of the Government of Canada, it's also mandated that the resource that Chin publishes complies with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines standard so that they are as accessible as possible for people with disabilities. So just as an example, all the content in the nomenclature website has language tags so that automated screen readers can read the content in multiple languages with the correct pronunciation for the visually impaired. Um, and as I mentioned before, we include the Canadian English and Canadian French variants, um, and that can include differences in spelling and also um, actual differences in terminology from, from one region to another. Um, I also already mentioned the Spanish from the AAT, and there is also interest among North American Indigenous language communities to see terminology from their languages and concepts from their cultures represented within nomenclature. So we've begun work with Inuktitut speaking groups, including the government of Nunavut, to include their terms and concepts. So as you can see here in the right-hand panel, with the inclusion of terms in Inuktitut in both um, the Latin script and the syllabics. Um, aside from English and French, um, technically we can include any language in, in any script that has an ISO tag. Uh, for example, we can include inepted to terms for the harpoon concept in both the default um, syllabic script and the Latin script. And But aside from that um, technical capability to include other languages, um, there is sort of the question of responsibility and governance for other languages. So, as I mentioned before, the Nomenclature Committee and the Canadian Nomenclature Committee are really only responsible for English and French. But according to sort of the, the terms of reference for the committee, the addition of additional languages is um, considered when a community of users has approached the Nomenclature Committee to request addition of terms in a specific language. So, for example, as the government of Nunavut has for Inuktitut. Um, and the language community obviously has to make a kind of commitment to support and develop the terminology in that language. Um, so, generally, the Nomenclature Committee doesn't solicit or um, review terms in other languages. Um, the, we stick to English and French, but um, we will trust the language community to manage their own language. Um, and other language communities can work at their own pace because only 
um, English and French are mandatory in nomenclature, and English and French are the only ones that are op offered as sort of options for the website user interface. Um, but other languages are always searchable and displayed in the concept record when they exist. Um, so there are two main ways that other languages can be included in nomenclature. Um, the first one here is what I just described. So where a language community takes responsibility for their own terms and um, actively works with the nomenclature committees and adds their terms directly into nomenclature. Um, ideally, those groups would form some kind of a committee of their own to maintain and develop the vocabulary in that language. So this is like what we're doing with the inuktitut terms. Um, the second way is for the language community to create their own uh, terminology resource or adapt a terminology resource in their own language. And then we can include those terms within nomenclature in a couple of different ways. So if that terminology in the other language is published as linked open data, we can add co-references um, wherever there's a match for mutual enrichment, sort of like we're doing with the AAT and the Spanish. Um, if the language community doesn't publish as linked open data, but even if they just have an ID for each concept, we could still match their vocabulary with nomenclature. Uh, for example, by using the reconciliation API that Triang will be talking about in a few minutes um, and include terms in their language within nomenclature. So in all of those scenarios, the language community is cited as the contributor of the terms to nomenclature. Um, okay, so as you have seen, nomenclature is built upon partnerships and community collaboration. There's a lot of volunteer effort that goes into this. And um, this list that, I, that you see here are the ones that Shin has formed to help support nomenclature. Um, I've already described the first five bullet points there, but I also wanted to mention that we're partnering with the Repertoire de Vedette Matière, uh, or RVM, uh, which is a project of Laval University in Quebec City that's used by uh, Canadian museums for indexing in French. And they're collaborating with us on the French translation of the GraphDB user interface, which you'll also see in a minute. Um, and also they're um, working with us to co-reference nomenclature and the RVM concepts for mutual data enrichment. Um, there's a group called Bindfrat, which is working with us to improve the French terminology in specific subject areas. Um, NICLA, we're just beginning to engage with them, but um, we're hoping that they'll potentially help ensure that nomenclature vocabulary is respectful and meets the needs of Indigenous communities. Uh, Graph DB, um, we have Chin has actually contributed the French interface for the GraphDB workbench. Um, pool party vocabulary management system, which is the, uh, the system that we're using on the back end to manage the vocabulary. Uh, we've contributed to the develop development of that tool as well by submitting tickets for improved features. And um, collections management software vendors. Um, and that last one, it's not um, uh, the collections management software vendors. It's not really a formal partnership, but more sort of a collaboration. We provide the vendors with the nomenclature data set and we rely on them to disseminate that nomenclature vocabulary to their museum clients for use in controlling data entry, enhancing search and data reconciliation. Um, we also had involvement from software vendors in testing nomenclature's linked open data features as we were developing them. So all that um, is basically to say that partnerships and collaboration for vocabulary development, for co-referencing, uh, for software and infrastructure, all of that collaboration is key to support multilingual vocabularies published as linked open data. Um, I'll now turn the presentation over to Trang, who will describe some of the technical side of things. All right, um, thank you so much, Heather. Um, so I will be talking a bit about the technical challenges and the solutions that um, Chin has faced in modernizing nomenclature and how we have designed nomenclature to be easy to implement using Lens Open Data and how we added support for multiple languages and scripts, design it for accessibility and how we support museums in integrating nomenclature with uh, museum collections management software. So just a very quick note that all the screenshots that you see in the slides here are of uh, a new user interface 
that will go live in a few weeks. So if you visit the site right now, it will be slightly different than what we, you see here. Um, so for most users of nomenclature, what you see on the public website, which is um, page.nomenclature.info, um, is all you need to know to use um, nomenclature. But for museums or software companies that would like to incorporate nomenclature within their system, uh, for example, to populate their term list for data entry or such a system, uh, the features that I will show you next will be important. So as Heather mentioned in uh, 2023, um, we launched a Spark endpoint, semantic resource a few for data sets and um, quantity IDF downloads and content negotiation. And an API is also available. So these are technical solutions that support ease of access for museums by enabling the terminology to be integrated within the uh, museum software to be used at lookup lists for data cleanup and reconciliation and for search assistance. So this screenshot shows the integration section on the nomenclature website. So this is where you would find everything you need to integrate nomenclature vocabulary within your collections management system. Uh, including a downloadable files in the CSV and linked data formats of the entire data set. Uh, the SWAT core endpoint, which enables you to uh, query the database um, following the semantic data model. We also um, provide the documentation for this uh, full semantic um, data model. Um, you also find the information about reconciling the museum data with nomenclature using um, the reconciliation services. And lastly, the API to uh, facilitate the integration of what we think most commonly used functions without um, the need to understand the semantic data model. So about um, nomenclature and integration with museum um, collections management systems or CMS. Um, the linked data features allow the developers and systems to have direct interaction with the database. So making it easier for nomenclature to be implemented into uh, museum collections management software and other applications. Our goal is to make nomenclature as widely and as easily used as possible to help uh, museums standardize the collections documentation and make the collections data more accessible, reusable and shareable. So there are a few ways, so here I already um, mentioned um, previously, but there are a few ways that um, nomenclature web services can be used. So um, collections management software vendors and museums have expressed interest in um, having uh, the vocabulary as a web service to be integrated directly into their applications. So they can use it as a term lookup or for data entry. Um, and then from selected terms, they can retrieve more information about the concepts such as definitions uh, or the alternative terms and terms in other languages. And um, these um, services also will be very useful for any batch operations. Other control vocabularies and knowledge bases like um, AAP and Wikidata can also use nomenclature web services to look up and add matching um, nomenclature concepts into their databases. And then uh, to automatically retrieve and extract more data from nomenclature to enrich their data sets. And vice versa, having nomenclature concepts aligned to these well used vocabularies will also increase um, the discoverability, usage, and integration into another knowledge basis. Um, and lastly, for um, the services, was very useful for data cleaning applications, um, such as uh, using the um, reconciliation service in OpenRefine. Um, let's see the next slide. Okay, so these are screenshots just to illustrate how the um, data cleaning tool called Verify can ut utilize the nomenclature reconciliation web service. So similar to the Wikidata reconciliation service. So, um, can, let's see, can match or reconcile the museum's data values with the nomenclature concepts to ensure clean and consistent data. So several terms will be suggested and you can select the most appropriate one. So if you're not sure, you can also um, provide the preview um, for each candidate match. Um, so then once the reconcilia reconciliation is complete, um, users can extract and enrich the data sets automatically by pulling in data from nomenclature. 
um, using the concept IDs at the access point. So as you can see in the bottom image, um, additional columns were added to add the English and French preferred terms. So uh, most uh, commercial collections management systems have included some version of um, nomenclature to assist with and control data entry and to enhance search. Um, these are just a few screenshots from nomenclature uh, implementations in uh, various museum software. Sorry for the siren. Uh, so next I want to talk about uh, some of the challenges we have faced in um, developing and supporting nomenclature as a uh, Linked open data vocabulary. So for, for managing the nomenclature vocabulary, we use a uh, software as a service called Pool Party by a semantic web company. Um, the data model is based on the Simple Knowledge Organization System or SCARF. So SCARF is a flat data model, so meaning that it can only describe a single thing, a concept. Um, it is perfect for managing basic data by the concepts in the vocabulary like labels and relations. And it is great for vocabulary editors who don't generally have a lot of technical expertise. Uh, but this simplicity for editors have its downsides for a complete representation of the data. Uh, with simple Scots, we can't adequately manage data about non-vocabulary concepts, such as um, information about the images, the contributors and sources of terms and definitions, and the labels for concepts. Uh, for example, the Grammar, grammatical gender of terms, especially for the French. Um, as such, it was not adequate for the standardized semantic publication of the vocabulary. So to solve these issues, um, we added some custom elements within our editorial system pool body to enable management of contextual information about terms and images, such as views for the grammatical gender of the French preferred label, for example, but while uh, pool party allows the creation of any number of custom elements to handle contextual data. They are not standardized, therefore posing a challenge for interoperability and integration. So to solve that issue, we added another um, graph database, uh, GraphDB, as the publication repository to handle the complex standardized data structure beyond SCARF. Um, we use um, ETL script to um, do a transformation from our simple editorial model in pool party um, a part of which is shown to the left uh, uh, on the slide to a standardized complex semantic model in GraphDB and show on the right here um, for data enhancement and publication so the complex semantic model reuses existing data models such as Dublin core schema.org um, and so on um, here you can see some of the standards we use. We also have some challenges with the language tag. In discussions with the government of Nunavut about the inclusion of terms in Inuktitut, uh, we saw that the SCOTS requirement for a single pref label, prefer label per language was uh, potentially problematic for them. Um, the ISO language codes, which are used to represent languages in RDF resources, only have the macro language Inuktitut and two sub-languages, Eastern Canadian Inuktitut and Western Canadian Inuktitut. So the government of Nunavut noted that even within the Western Canadian Inuktitut sub-language, there are many different dialects. So one language community speaking Western Canadian Inuktitut might prefer one term over another, but with SCAR, only one can be the pref label and the others are assigned as alternative, which implies an inherent preference by the vocabulary publisher. So this can be an indication that further regional division within the language codes may be necessary. Um, we are so required to use language tags to make nomenclature accessible. The so screen readers required all content to have language tags so that they can properly pronounce words in any language. So for the vocabulary content, um, the terms are already tagged in by, by the language, but uh, we must ensure that all elements of the user interface for the nomenclature website, um, the GraphDB workbench, and the Sparkle endpoints are also tagged by language. This is a challenge particularly for content such as um, bibliographies and Sparkle queries. 
So related to this is the handling of language tags in uh, vocabulary management systems. So um, if you are planning to manage multilingual vocabularies, carefully assess the capabilities of the system to handle ISO language tags. Most systems will manage the basic language tags, but also consider the handling of um, region codes that are part of the language tags. For example, these are what allow us to identify a term as Canadian English or Canadian French. Um, re these region tags are sometimes not standardized in the vocabulary management systems. Also handling of script tags. So for example, this is how we manage the Latin script for um, indigenous languages. So out of the box and vocabulary management software can only handle the default syllabic script. Customization to add to more languages as needed. Um, our vocabulary management system came out of the box ready to manage a very long list of world languages, but we had to customize it to manage indigenous North American languages. Although we will not meet them all, we added the most commonly spoken indig indigenous languages in the USA, Canada, and Mexico. We also made a small change to one of the nomenclature's oldest conventions. Um, because of a um, nomenclature convention that existed from its beginnings in 1978, the other terms besides the preferred term for a concept was called non-preferred terms. Since the idea from the very early on in nomenclature's development was to encourage museums to choose a single standardized term, the preferred term, for cataloging. Non-preferred terms were only meant to point people to the preferred term for a concept. But we found that labeling certain terms, which may be the preferred term in a given language community, as non-preferred was problematic. After discussion with the government of Nunavut, we changed from non-preferred to alternative term to be more respectful of and ensure access to a different dialects and regional terms used by diverse communities within one ISO language subtag. And one more change I want to mention, although you will not see it um, in this or any record on the nomenclature website, we are using the Scots property hidden label for offensive or disrespectful terms. By using hidden label, the concept and its prefer and alternative terms are still found in the search for the offensive term, but the offensive term itself is not displayed. And with any project, there are um, resource limitations, but I want to address here some specific challenges and solutions for vocabulary management. Um, there are a lot of uh, different vocabulary management systems available from software as a service to open source solutions. Um, turnkey solutions can be very expensive and may not include all the functionality you need for a project. But on the other hand, open source software requires a variety of specialized expertise and some server cap capacity and other infrastructure. So um, solutions could include um, using the tools for one word project to get better value for your investment or to create partnerships with other organizations which are also involved in vocabulary management. Partnerships can involve not just financial resources but also sharing of data and expertise and sometimes technical infrastructure. Um, future and potential solutions. Um, so the first point is about co-modeling. Um, in the future, we would like to see the communities that use nomenclature involved in the data modeling itself, and not only in the content or revision or enhancement process. The second point is about flexibility. Um, in many cases, when we work on decol decolonization, for more inclusive vocabularies, we focus on the terms, but the model is never questioned. Um, it would be interesting to assess um, the nomenclature data model according to different worldviews or to develop a flexible model to allow concepts to be arranged based on multiple worldviews. The third point um, by Sidoc theorem, so for those that are not familiar with Sidoc theorem, it is a conceptual reference model developed by the International Council of Museums ICOM Documentation Committee. Um, it provides an extensible semantic framework for concepts and information in cultural heritage and museum documentation. Um, the Getty Vocabulary Program recently adopted the doc theorem is um, a unifying data model, for example, in its vocabulary such as AAT. 
um, if nomenclature could reuse a similar structure based on pseudoxorum, it would allow someone use the query Getty data to easily access nomenclature data. Uh, as Heather mentioned previously, some crowdsourced matching work is already being done through Wikidata Miss and Match, and term um, submissions are also crowdsourced from the museum community, community in a way, but there may be other opportunities um, here. And of course, uh, we would be interested in working with any language communities, particularly indigenous communities, to add terms in their languages and concepts from their cultures. So we hope that this presentation has given you a good overview of nomenclature and its benefits to museums, how it is developed and governed, and some perspectives on how working with language communities can support museums' efforts to a diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. Um, we are continually working to promote the use of nomenclature, find new collaborators to add other languages, and to find ways to ease the integration of vocabulary in the museum content management tools to increase the discoverability of museum collections. Uh, we also continue to create links with other vocabularies to increase discoverability and use of cultural data. The creation of meaning through the harmonization of diverse vocabularies is an important component of our work. Uh, so here's the contact info for Heather and myself. So we have some time for a question now. Or please feel free to contact us at any time. Thank you so much. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, there's a lot of information to process. Um, feel free to uh, drop questions you might have into the chat or unmute yourself. Uh, also, you can use the Slack if you're in there. Um, I've been sharing some links from the presentation in the chat and in the Slack. Um, we did get one one very uh, Favorable comments that, about what an interesting presentation this was from Huda Khan at Stanford. Um, so, and I, I guess I had a question uh, um, that I could use to start the discussion uh, because maybe folks are needing a bit of time to think of some questions. Uh, oh, I see one came in. Um, Dessa is interested in hearing more about the selection process for community content contributions? Is there any criteria that makes it more likely for suggestions to be accepted? Yeah, I can respond to that. Um, in terms of the terminology, if that's what you're asking, like um, submissions by the community for either new terminology or changes to existing terminology, um, I would say um, it's more likely for suggestions to be accepted if the person that has submitted the concept or the term has a good working knowledge of how nomenclature is structured and you know some of the principles, the conventions like the possibility of cross-referencing. Um, oftentimes um, there are suggestions for terms that are kind of out of scope of nomenclature. So those are kind of um, you know, if the person that's submitting them already has a good knowledge of the scope and conventions and structure, it's um, generally almost certainly going to be accepted. But does that answer your question? And ter in terms of images, um, we have a very small group of, of um, like a subcommittee that's working on images. And for those, we have some pretty strict guidelines that the images have to be um, you know, free of text so that we don't have to worry about um, translation or alt text, um, adding alt text about the content of the text and images and that sort of thing. Um, the images have to be um, free of copyright and um, a clear illustration of whatever the concept is that's um, being represented. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, I had a question um, about the language, you know, some of the issues you mentioned with language um, uh, and dialects. Uh, has there been any um, uh, efforts on, you know, the, on behalf of the nomenclature um, uh, committees to uh, reach out to the ISO uh, standards body to uh, get languages 
um, or dialects added to the standard? Or could you talk a bit more about uh, work in that direction or any explorations uh, you all have done? Um, at this point, we haven't reached out to that community, although I think it would be worthwhile to do. Um, we it's, At this point, it's just something that we've flagged as an issue, but not really had time to deal with. Um, and we've only really noticed it as an issue when we started to add the terms in and up to touch. So um, I think it's something that we will have to address shortly. And um, I'm curious as well, we heard uh, there was a presentation earlier uh, today about translating homothorus into Spanish. Um, so, you know, another uh, sort of ontology. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, Ernesto Cuba, the, the presenter, talked about how it's not that straightforward to, to translate always. And I'm wondering if this has been the experience uh, with any of the languages of nomenclature as well, where rather than uh, translating, sometimes you just have to add like a term in, in, in one language and, uh, or have different terms for, uh, for the various languages. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, and all the issues that surround that type of language issue. Yeah, we do. We do come across that issue quite a bit, and um, and we don't really have the luxury of not translating because we have to have the English and French bilingual. Um, that's a mandatory. Um, that's mandatory for nomenclature. Um, we, in some cases, when the terms aren't an exact match between the two languages, um, we'll add some scope notes to kind of like. A chair is this in English, and but in French, it, you know, we'll add little notes to describe the slight differences between the terms in different languages. And um, there's also um, often, for especially for French, sometimes the, the terms will have to be, will have to kind of include qualifiers. So. In English, if there's not a specific term that matches the French, the English term could include a little bit more descriptive information right in the, the term itself um, to make sure it's actually um, equivalent to the concept that's being described in French. Um, I have another question as well. Um, could you talk a bit more about the connection with the Getty uh, Art and Architecture Thesaurus? And is that, um, you might have mentioned this, uh, so apologies if you did, is that sort of a continuously refreshed connection or is it uh, kind of done on, you know, every so often or, or what's, what's the... What's the what's um, yeah, so they... The Getty Vocabulary Program kind of did a big project back a few years ago to do all the co-referencing, but of course the AAT is changing all the time and nomenclature is changing all the time. So we um, we have some scripts that are running and we can check where there are, you know, um, one many to one or one to many relationships that need to be fixed where we can't have a exact match. Um, for the same concept, for example. Um, and as new concepts are added to nomenclature, we create these lists of modifications that need to be made in the co-referencing between um, nomenclature and AAT, and we submit them to the Getty and they make the changes and then we run our scripts to update nomenclature. So it's, it is generally kind of done in batches like that where um, we'll collect um, corrections to be made and every once in a while submit them to the Getty and they'll change stuff. So yeah, Wikidata is more of a ongoing process. Um, we had, um, as I think I mentioned before, we had kind of a, a more intensive project a few years back where we had uh, really gung-ho volunteers, a very small group, but um, since then everyone's been busy and the Chin team has been really busy with the development work so we haven't really been pushing on that co-referencing work with Wikidata but um, that's something that we'd like to pick up again and 
and find maybe, you know, refresh the existing volunteers enthusiasm and find maybe some new volunteers. So, um, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be a work in progress always. Great. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, finding some new volunteers. Should should people just reach out to you at the emails you shared in your pre presentation slides if they are interested in volunteering? Yeah, that would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And um, one last question. Um, it was great to see um, the Open and Refine uh, um, uh, reconciliation endpoints. Um, I was wondering uh, on the the um, page that you shared, I, I dropped it into the Slack, the integration page. Does that include details about um, how the, like, the address for that uh, reconciliation endpoint so that folks can set that up in their own Open Refine instance? Yeah. Okay. The um, integration page on the uh, Nomenclature website, yeah, that would include the link to the uh, service. Wonderful. Okay, well, we are at time, but uh, we are able to uh, continue uh, if, if, you, if there are more questions or if there's anything else that you all wanted to share, uh, because we had scheduled a social um, uh, open-ended social block, but uh, the social subcommittee hasn't been, has been doing more stuff in Slack rather than synchronously. So um, if anyone has any more questions, questions. Uh, now is the time to ask them. Otherwise, we can uh, end this on schedule. Um, I'll give a plug for the social Slack uh, So uh, and how to get involved with that. Um, if, if I can pull it up real quick. But thank you. Uh, thank you, Heather, and thank you, Trang, for a fantastic presentation, really interesting projects. Um, and thank, thank you. So Slides. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, folks get in touch with you and uh, if they have follow-up questions that they weren't able to, to make during the session. Yeah. Thank you.